Hello, and welcome back to Hemophyte Breakdowns. Today, I'm going to be going over a fight I had a couple of weekends ago at Sword Quench 2024 against Brandon Zipplinger. I wanted to cover this fight for two primary reasons. One, it was a really good fight, and two, it has some stipulations on an earlier video I made about attack and preparation. During this fight, I do a couple of moves that get me some really nice points, but I want to kind of call into question whether or not those are really a good idea or not. So. We'll go through the fight till we get to about one of those instances, and then I'll cut out some of the exchanges in the fight because there were 16 of them, and try to refine it down to that specific topic. But for now, we'll just start at the beginning. So for our first exchange, we start off with a bit of a weird one. My opponent closes into measure, thrusts at me, I do a little bit of a short edge deflection over to my left side, and then I throw a duplerin. If you don't know what a duplerin is, in my mind, it's anything where you parry someone off to the outside line, but keep the inside line, and then reapproach with your sword, usually edge first, on that same inside line and hit them in the head. Basically, you imagine you box somebody out and then you stay on that kind of line to make sure that if they try to come back in and hit you, your sword will still be in the way as you hit them. It's a really great idea. But I think a lot of people interpret this uh, play, specifically to play to be highly specific. And I don't think there's any real reason to because something like this fits the description very well. And it also gets away from some of the problems that you see where people want something to be so highly specific that they start calling things that maybe fit something else entirely and then suddenly sit back and go, well, why aren't there any duplerins in tournaments? In my mind, this is a perfect duplerin, a perfect example of one. And though it looks like not much happened during the exchange, a pretty good example of how to hit and stay safe. So I've skipped a couple of exchanges, but I wanted to make sure to look at this one because it's very interesting in how it doesn't have an exact interpretation as far as I know, but it looks remarkably similar to something you might see in Kendo. My opponent comes in, taps my blade, mostly just to provoke a response. My response, of course, is to go up into a cron parry, something that I do all the time, even sometimes when I shouldn't. And my opponent takes advantage of this by pulling their hands up into the air with their point basically pointed straight towards the ceiling and then does a Scheidelhau, a vertical descending cut right to the top of my head over my cron guard. And this is something that's pretty difficult for a lot of people to do because they sometimes think that all descending cuts from German or even Italian longsword must be along these 45 degree angle lines. And Far too few people realize how strong and viable a straight, directly vertical line straight to the top of somebody's head really is, because in order to parry something that's coming straight down, you have to either go up against it, you know, uh, vertical against vertical, or you have to push it to the side. And in both of those options, you have a bit of a conundrum. If you try to do what I did, push straight up into the air with a cron parry, well, it's great if you can get your cross guard all the way up to the level of your head, but that's actually a really long way to travel. And as you saw here, the ability of my opponent to throw that horizontal cut with their hands very high, almost to the level of their head, meant that their cut didn't look like it actually had a whole lot of degrees of travel or rotation, but it managed to hit me flat on the top of the head. And I don't mean flat in terms of with the flat of the blade, but flat along a horizontal plane meaning that in order to parry it, my cron parry had to reach just that high before I would have been safe. Because I couldn't make it in time, he got off a really, really clean shot right to the top of my head and was able to bind me up afterwards when I tried to do the same thing back to him. I said earlier this is something remarkably similar to kendo because if you ever watch a kendo match, this is probably the most common cut that they train kendo people to do and probably one of the most common ones you see in competition. And I think it's remarkable that People don't necessarily do this so much, primarily because they've been trained in either German or Italian lineages, and most of those tell you to throw your descending cuts at a 45 degree angle. So it kind of ticks two really important boxes, one being that it's difficult to parry, and two being that people don't use it or train it enough, so not a whole lot of people even know what's going on when you throw it. Definitely something that you should try out in your own sparring, but for now, it got my opponent two clean points. So now we get to the uh, exchange that I was talking about at the beginning, the attack in preparation that I want to call into question a little bit. And as you saw from the execution here, 
My opponent comes forward with a threatened thrust that, in, at least in my mind, their intention was to pull out of and throw a Zverkow from once I bound against it, but instead of binding against it or throwing any real defense at all, I simply slip my body to my left side and throw a thrust underneath to the belly. And technically speaking, this is a perfect execution of an attack in prep, given that my opponent was clearly preparing to throw something else after their initial thrust missed, mine landed, and then in a right-of-way tournament, it would be pretty clear that mine had the priority. However, we don't always like to talk about things in terms of priority and right-of-way. We like to talk about things of, well, how might this have worked in a different rule set? And in an afterblow rule set, we run into a little bit of a problem here, and that is... The fact that my thrust does land against the belly, and as you see in the footage, get a whole lot of bend, my opponent manages to bail out of their missed thrust, more or less in time, to whack me on the side of the head as they pass me by. And there's a question there of whether or not that's really the smart thing to do from either one of us. In my opinion, low thrusts have a really serious problem in that they can usually land pretty effectively, especially if they're going down to the, uh, the lower belly where most people's center of gravity is. It's a place that tends not to move around a lot. And as a result, can land a whole lot. But the problem is, is that you also have to give up all of your defense to do it. And relying on a almost boxer-esque slip to the side isn't always really the safest option when, as we talked about earlier, most people are trained to throw their cuts at 45 degree angles. And it's ironic here that regardless of whether or not this cut was 45 or vertical, there still would have been more than enough of my body in the way to get hit. It's really just a matter of whether or not you consider it a smart or you know, martially valid idea that you can move your head out of the way of danger to a point where it would be remarkably difficult to cut accurately while basically giving up some other part of your body. There's no version of reality where I land this thrust and my opponent can't just hit me for free, whether it's real life TM or if it's an afterblow rule set where he's allowed to do so one tempo after the fact. So I would probably say that this is not necessarily a really great idea or a way to execute in tap attack and prep unless it's a rule set where right of way exists. But even then, you want to be really, really careful, not only because your thrust might get missed or you might miss it, but also because the chances of you getting hit really hard in the head, regardless of whether or not the hit counts, is kind of high. So for the next exchange, and again, I have skipped a few, we have another instance of the exact same situation, but one that plays out a little bit differently. Uh, you see a similar sort of setup. My opponent goes in for a little bit of a fainted thrust, pulls off to throw a cut, and once again, I attack them in the preparation of their second cut by stabbing them in the belly. Though this time, you see significantly less of a lean over to my left side, and as a result, the cut that I attacked during the prep of comes right down on the top of my shoulder. And this is where we talk about, once again, the validity of this kind of move as it might pertain to an afterblow rule set. Because I have given up all of my defense with the sword, my only real defense comes from more or less trying to put a lower priority target in the path of my opponent's attack in the hopes that they are unable to track my head as I throw it from one side to the other. It can definitely work, and, but... As I said before, it's definitely very dangerous, and as we see here, if you don't do enough of a lean, well, you don't move your head enough and it can still be struck. It's also very important to note that this is a definite uh, case of my opponent throwing a rather short and snappy cut onto the top of my shoulder. In some cases, I think because he didn't want to hurt me, but also because he had to react to being stabbed in the belly. So it's one thing to talk about whether or not like this would work in real life i don't really concern myself with that question most of the time but i do think it's worth questioning whether or not this is something you would want to do in an afterblow rule set and what we see here is that if you don't get a good enough lean it works even worse than maybe the 50 50 you might have gotten by leaning all the way to the floor so for our next exchange we have another example of the same principle but this time without the thrust now, looking at the thrust previously, there were some advantages and disadvantages, and you see some of them here the same when I throw a cut to the arm on the outside line instead. However, there are some new advantages and disadvantages that I think are worth pointing out. Uh, the first, and the most obvious, is that yes, my head is still offline and is still remarkably hard to hit, but because I am throwing an attack, in this case from my left to my right towards my opponent's arm, my head moving all the way to my left hip means that there's more of a chance that my blade is going to be in the way of any attack that comes in. 
or at least you would think that. The problem here, though, is that because I'm getting so low, my hands are always going to naturally be lower than my opponent's. And keeping my head lower than my hands might be something that I can do myself. It's almost impossible for me to have my hands up high enough in perspective to my head to make it so that my opponent's now very descending cut is going to have a hard time getting around that. From you see here, my opponent does a pretty good job of pivoting on his axis the second he sees me go all the way down to my left side. And it's pretty easy for him to just pop me on the top of the head, no matter how much I lean and no matter how much I try to get my hands in the way. And I think this is one of these problems where on principle or in paper, you might think that, oh, well, if I just get low enough or if I just cut well enough or if I'm just fast enough, this can work. And I think the problem is, is that if you ever include the concept of an afterblow in a tournament rule set, which obviously most tournaments do, this is really just a kind of great way to get hit on the head and give your opponent a one point advantage in the uh, afterblow washout. So this next one is the final exchange of the match and one in which I will tell you that my opponent only needed one point to win. So it really helps to emphasize the serious disadvantages of trying this kind of thing. And another thing I want to point out is not only did this happen again, I once again tried to dip my head all the way to my left side, throw a hand cut, and this time I was really kind of going for the body in the hopes of managing to hit a two-point target. But uh, one thing to point out is that my opponent did a really smart adaptation to this, and it's a variation of a dolphin step, which I have done a video on before, but if you don't know what that is, it's basically where you pull your front foot back to your back foot and suck in your gut a little bit, and it's a really great way of making sure that your lower body, both your legs and your torso, are not viable in range targets anymore. And it was a really smart thing for my opponent to do because he knew going up into this that I had scored four critical points off of these low belly thrusts already, but I had failed on the hand cuts twice now. And now this time when he sees me go for it, he sucks in his legs and he sucks in his belly, ensuring that I can't actually hit that two-point target. And while I do manage to hit the arm on this, it means that his free headshot gives him the one point he needed to win. So it was a really critically good adaptation and one where if, for example, you're ever seeing someone do this to you, you know exactly what you can do to try to shut it down. Doing this kind of boxing style slip off to one side requires a huge amount of commitment and it requires you to put you in a position where you can't really defend yourself anymore. So if you're in a tournament where there is no right of way and you're no longer offered any defense as far as people's inability to hit you after the, in the afterblow, you want to be really careful not to do this very much. But also, more importantly, that even if there is a right-of-way style rule set where theoretically attacking in prep can just get you the win and you don't have to really care about what happens after, make sure to know that you can do this kind of step that my opponent does here and probably win anyway. Because regardless of whether or not that hand shot or that arm shot lands, you can know for sure that you are going to hit them in the head. And if there's even a 50-50 shot that they missed their swing because you moved your body out of the way, well, then that's a pretty great system to be under when you know the right of way has to now come down to whether or not you were really in preparation when they hit you in the arm or when they were a little bit too slow and now they just got hit in the head with the attack. So that's going to be it, a little bit of a short one, but if you'd like to submit your own footage or see yourself on this channel, feel free to send me an email at at gmail.com, and I'll see you on Thursday.